All right, so we're in Windows World. I've been spending a lot of time here. I mean, it's my favorite place to come, Building 26. You're in Windows now. Who are you? I'm um, Mark Rosinovich. Uh -huh. I'm a technical fellow in CoreOS. Okay. I came to Microsoft about six months ago when my company, Winternal Software, was acquired. Okay. Yeah, now we've heard of that, Sysinternals. Uh -huh. Sysinternals is a website that Bryce Cogswell and I started about in 1996, I okay. guess. And it was. Uh, we started to do Windows NT stuff and <laughs> wrote some tools, mm -hmm. wanted a place to put them up so that other people could use them. Mm -hmm. It's no fun to write a tool when you're the only one that's using it. Exactly. And the web was getting popular back then, so we threw up a website. It was called ntinternals.com, and mm -hmm. we started to put those tools up. And even by standards back then, it was popular within a few months. Mm -hmm. And it's just been growing and growing and growing ever since. It's still growing in popularity. Now, cool. Even now, after it's become a Microsoft Tech Center on TechNet. Excellent. I mean, you clearly understand Windows probably almost as well as the Windows people understand it. I mean, I guess that's fair to say. If you're writing low-level tool, tools for NT, I mean, you have to know what you're doing, what the system is so, doing. So, yeah, that, that's actually one of the reasons that I did write those tools, is so that I could see what the system was doing. One <laughs> of the first tools that, actually the first tool that I wrote for, Win, for Windows NT was a, a Sorry about that. There's no a problem. utility called Control to Cap, which just swaps the caps lock into a control key. And you know, I'm running it even now on this keyboard because uh, I come from Unix. Okay. Right? Through grad school, I was working on Unix systems and on Unix oh. keyboards. That's a, a control key, not a caps lock key. So okay. I, I was like uncomfortable on a PC keyboard. How can I get myself comfortable? Well, I need. I'd, I'd really like this to be a, a control key, and there was no Windows mapping. UI power tool or anything back then. Mm -hmm. So I realized that I could, if I wrote a driver that would intercept the caps lock and switch it into control, then that would be something low level enough that it would act like it, this Windows would see it as a real control key. And so the first mm -hmm. tool that I wrote was a keyboard filter driver. It sits in the kernel and it watches the keystrokes <laughs> come in from the keyboard driver before Windows gets them and then looks for the caps lock and changes into control. That's but this, but then, uh, at that, after that point, I was like, oh, this filtering model is really cool. What else yeah. can I see going on inside of Windows? And mm -hmm. so wrote a tool called Filemon uh -huh. with Bryce Cogswell. Filemon, a lot of people that are familiar with System Turtles have heard of Filemon. Yeah. And it's a tool that watches what's going on in your file system. Uh, every process, what reads, writes. It's an awesome tool. Thanks. Yeah. Most have you, used it? Have you used it? it? Yes, I have used it. So that, uh, that was the second tool that we wrote mm -hmm. for Windows NT. And that tool I wrote just because, hmm, let's, let me explore the filtering model and, you know, this accomplishes two purposes. One, yeah. in the process of doing this, I learn about Windows. Two, I learn how Windows operates. Because mm -hmm. writing the tool, I learn how filter drivers and the file systems work. And then once the tool's written, I get to watch what's going on and learn what, what's happening. Cool. So, I mean, why Windows? I mean, it's an interesting question. Yeah, I mean, what, yeah. you know, why, why didn't you stick with Unix? So, um, the way that I got into Windows actually didn't wasn't a direct jump from Unix to NT, but actually I stopped at Windows 3.1 and Windows 95 along the way. Back when I was in grad school at Carnegie Mellon, my PhD thesis was on fault tolerance and putting mechanisms into the BSD kernel that would allow, allow you to put fault tolerance and fault recovery policies on top of a base OS. Cool. In fact, it was like the, the mechanism that I put into BSD was like system call hooking, which I took advantage of later with the tool called Regmon and Windows NT, where you intercept system calls and then you call out to your policy hooks and they do extra things. And mm -hmm. the things that I did uh, for Unix were, for example, checkpointing and rollback so that you could run your Win Unix system. If you had a problem, the system crashed. You could reboot, restart at the previous checkpoint, and then it would even replay your mouse and keyboard input up nice. to the point, you know, where you wanted it to stop or the system failed. Windows 3.1 was the popular desktop or OS at the time, consumer OS, mm -hmm. and uh, had a notorious reputation for reliability. Mm -hmm. And people's system locks up or crashes all the time, and they lose stuff. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was a great opportunity for commercializing that and putting checkpointing and rollbacking and roll back into Windows 3.1. So I learned Windows 3.1 internals. Mm -hmm. And then Windows 95 came out and I learned Windows 95 internals to do it there. And then Windows NT uh, 3.51 mm. came out. 
and that's when I noticed it, noticed NT line. I'd heard about it before, but sure. Then I was like, uh, the commercialization stuff didn't go very far because mm -hmm. really you need support from hardware vendors to do that kind of thing. But uh, when Windows NT, when I saw Windows NT, said you know they've got this server operating system, workstation operating system, and then with mm -hmm. a, a UI that's the same on the workstation and the server. And it's the same UI as the consumer version of Windows, Windows 3.1. So mm -hmm. they've automatically got this user base, people, uh, this user base that's going to be familiar Absolutely. going from their home systems into work and using the, com the corporate versions of the software. So sure. whereas Unix, is, you basically have to get a degree in Unix to go <laughs> do Unix stuff. So sure. So that's where I said this is the future of operating systems. Cool. So what is it about NT that makes it so stable, in your opinion? It's funny that you asked that question, because five years ago you probably would have asked it slightly differently or avoided <laughs> that question, right? Yeah. Uh, what's, what makes it different that it's so stable, than, different than what? Let me ask that. Well, I mean, let's, let's talk about, I mean, clearly an operating system that has, like, Windows 95 or Windows 98 or uh -huh. even Windows 2000. Of course, Windows 2000 is based on the NT structure. Yeah. Uh, infrastructure. But what is it about the architecture that NT... Uh, let me think about NT kernel. Yeah. Uh, you know, was there not a user mode and kernel mode in '95? No, there was a user mode and kernel mode. But once you got into user mode, there was no boundaries between processes. So when you're running, oh, you're logged into your system. There's a whole bunch of processes running. There's Explorer, and then there's Notepad, and the other processes that you run, and they're all in their boxes. Mm -hmm. So they can't mess with each other. Mm -hmm. without going out of their way to do so, uh, and they can't mess with the kernel. In Windows 95, there, there was no boundary. Even though there was two modes of operation, kernel mode and user mode, user mode, you could just mess with the kernel without anybody getting in the way, and they could mess with each other accidentally. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's most of the time in Windows 95, it was accidental sure. problems where you have a process and it's got a bad pointer, and that bad pointer now references something in the kernel. Mm -hmm. And so it goes and writes you know, some text there because it thinks it's a buffer that it's going to be mm -hmm. storing some text in. It actually happens to be overwriting a driver that's in the kernel. And the, <laughs> that driver starts to execute and the system sure. gets blue screens. So it kind of you know, does away with the notion of security. Right, so well, reliability too. Yeah. There was no security and <laughs> no reliability. So, so now so you get that's the not the case. Uh, in Windows Vista, I mean, we you know we've been covering a lot of stuff on Windows, and one of the things that uh, you know it seems clear to me is that Windows Vista is our most reliable system mm -hmm. today. It is our most secure system today, and so some of the things to ask would be, you know, how can we say that? Why can we say that? From a from a operating, I mean, I'm an operating systems guy. I love operating systems. You're an operating yeah. systems guy. You know, let's talk about. From an operating system's point of view, why is Vista, why can we say things like that? Like, you know, we're not marketing, but I mean, yeah. why can I say, I think Windows Vista is the most reliable version of Windows yet, or so, yeah. most secure. Yep. So yeah. there's two ways to look, look at it. One is uh, the way that it was developed, which is from start to finish, the secure development lifecycle SDL, which Michael Howard's the big, I don't know if you've covered Michael. Yeah, we got Mike, we've had Michael yeah. on here so, before. So, uh, I guess people can go look at his channel and interview and learn sure. about SDL, but Vista was done with SDL, and SDL means that at every step of the development process you're looking at, are we doing this stuff securely, are we handling strings and buffers that are coming in from outside securely, and mm -hmm. if you're not doing that from the ground up, you can't, you don't have a good degree of confidence in how you were handling that stuff, and that means that there could be cases where you're missing it. Mm -hmm. And uh, any case where you miss it and you're communicating with some untrusted outside location, is a potential machine compromise. Sure. So that's one reason that you can say it's the most secure. But then you go and look at the features and defense in depth kind of things that have been added into Windows Vista that weren't there previously and mm -hmm. that gets you even further like uh, address space layout randomization, ASLR, where uh, Windows XP SP2 introduced something called data execution prevention or DEP, okay. which locks down Co uh, areas of memory that should never be executed and marks it as non-executable using hardware support. Okay. So a virus comes in across the network and affects a service and most of the time it's through a buffer overflow someplace in the heap or in the stack mm -hmm. and the 
virus tries to take advantage of that buffer overflow by putting code in the heap or the stack that it's then going to cause the program to jump into and start executing its malicious payload. Sure. With DEP, you can, uh, any, any heap and stack that might have code placed into it, the second the service tries to go and execute that code, when it's tricked to by the virus, it's going to blow up. And so the virus isn't going get, to gonna get very far. But there are cases where virus might be able to get into a service through other mechanisms that aren't caught by DEP. Okay. And once it's inside, once it's made its way in, infected the service, then the first thing it wants to do is start to call operating system services. Like, hey, I want to drop myself onto the, into the file system so that I'm there the next time the system boots. Mm -hmm. And to do that, it needs to know where, which, at which address these functions reside. Virus writers have had it pretty easy up until Windows Vista because on Windows XP, for example, uh, if there's a function in the kernel in kernel 32.dll, this one of the core system DLLs, mm -hmm. like create file, that's always going to be at a specific address, and so they can just write and they run their, writing their virus say, well, I know that I can call address 0x7 blah blah blah, and ah. that's going to be create file. Okay. Because there's no uh, when, when they get in on the machine, they can't call a function that says, tell me where create file is located because they'd have to know where that function is located. They, sure. They get proc address function, for example, okay. which is what you, they'd have to call for that. But on Windows Vista, because of ASLR, kernel 32 never loads in the same place every time the system boots. Excellent. And so, so now they they don't know where current where so is. It a, is. So, you know, I don't mean to interrupt you, but we haven't really covered that very much, John. Uh -huh. I mean, Jim Alch in the interview we did, he mentioned it very briefly. But it was Jim Alchin, you know, he's not an architect, he's not an engineer. Uh -huh. But he is a computer scientist, so he, you know, shouldn't give, actually give him more props than that. Yeah, and he's, he's an also, he was a big champion for getting of course. insulin. So I don't know why I said that, yeah. so excuse me, Jim. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I, I didn't mean any disrespect. Um, let's talk a little bit about that. So it, the algorithm is probably going to be pretty complicated, pretty nonlinear. It's got to be random. Yeah, it's actually not that complicated. And really? I, yeah, and I mentioned, I, I describe it in a, kind of basic level in uh, uh, the third part of my Windows Vista kernel changes Excellent. article. It's called, it's inside the Windows Vista kernel. I've, I've looked it's, through it. Yeah, in Technet Magazine. Excellent. Uh, February, March, and April issues. Cool. So that's in the, the April issue, which is not going to, it's not out yet. Okay. But uh, I talk about basically how ASLR works and it work. It does uh, mm -hmm. randomization of the executable itself, so the exe is never in the same place. Run, every time you run Notepad or any Windows Vista component, because yeah. all Windows Vista components are compiled with this flag that says to the system, "You can move me around." Excellent. Uh, so anytime you run a executable Windows Vista executable, the memory manager goes and picks from one of 256 locations that in this range near where the executables says that it liked to, it, it likes to start yeah. and places it someplace randomly in there. And then the same thing happens for DLLs. The first DLL it loads in the process, it puts it in a certain place, one of 256 locations mm -hmm. that are near where the DLL wanted to launch, and then it places other DLLs close, to, close to that one to pack, pack them together so they don't get all spread out all over the place, which it would, would happen mm -hmm. if it did each one randomly. So, and this of course has no implications for any sort of attached process like a debugger? Nope, the debugger, all that information about where things are loaded is obtained dynamically by the debugger. So, okay. it, it's not making assumptions about where things reside. Either. Sure, so the memory yeah. manager takes care of, yeah. of where things... Yeah, that, it's to basically totally transparent. That's awesome. Yeah. The That's only, pretty amazing. Yeah, it is, it is really cool. But uh, the, the shame is that it can't go and do this to everything. It, it does it only to images that have this special flag in it that developers have to place in Why? the image. Why? Why is that? And that's because there's cases where code, for some reason, has some kind of subtle dependency on where, well, it's usually subtle, but it can be explicit about where it loads into memory. And so the developers, you know, mm. addressing, uh, because it loads in memory in this place, this other thing is in a certain place, this buffer's in a certain place. Interesting. And there might be a bug in the program where it goes over the end of a buffer. Okay. And if it loads in a certain place in memory, that is hidden from the program. It's a kind of a silent bug and the app seems to work. But if it loads someplace else, that then that triggers the bug shows up in some visible way. 
Now, you know, it sounds to me like is it could this now is that the same? Is that true in X sixty four world, or do we require um, in X sixty four world? Do it all? And, yeah, it's true in X sixty four world too. Okay, uh, that those guys have to be put a flag. Way. Yeah, that's interesting. Could it be done automatically, or is a flag required so that the memory manager? I mean, could it could it be done automatically? Yeah, it could be done without a flag. We, yeah, it could be done without a flag. But okay. then we'd have cases where pro people's programs would crash. Uh, on Vista, where they didn't crash on XP, or well, oh, because they weren't write, written correctly. Yeah, because they weren't okay, or, or or yeah, because they were written with some kind of explicit or implicit dependency on where they're loading into memory. So yeah, that's interesting. So what else? What I mean, what, let, let's talk. About, I mean, that's that's yeah. a huge thing. Yeah. So so you, now you get the combination of ASLR and DEP, and that makes it even harder for viruses to get in. And then you talk to Scott Field about yeah. service security hardening. Absolutely. Which one of the most uh, one of the way, uh, the most common way that a system exposes itself to the network is through services, and which are running all the time. Have ports open so that other machines can talk to the service. Yep. And now, when you have service security hardening that Scott talked about, plus ASLR and DEP, mm -hmm. now you've hardened that entryway that now we're usually take, tries to take advantage of. If you look at the network propagating worms like SQL Slammer and yeah. the DCOM vulnerability and uh, IS indexing vulnerability that uh, Code Red took advantage of. All of those kinds of things are blocked with these techniques. Excellent. And just just so people who are watching this, because the Scott Field interview, you know, find it on Channel Nine. It's not that hard, my friends. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but I provide a link on, in, in this blur. But it's basically stating that services run at lowest pri at the lowest privilege, yeah. right? And yeah. they can't do things that would require system access without elevating. In which case we would be informed yeah. as users yeah. that something strange is going on. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So the, yeah, fundamentally it's in Windows XP there were three service security accounts, local service, network service, and local system. Mm -hmm. On Windows Vista, it and so services on Windows Vista still run in one of those three accounts. Sure. But each service has different requirements about what privileges and what access access to what objects it needs. So what Windows Vista and Service Security Harding does is Let's take uh, things that run in local service and split them into things that run in local service but need these privileges and access to these kinds of things and cool. ones that need different set of privileges and we'll separate those and now there's different basically degrees of each of those accounts now and it's just uh, cool. kind of dynamically generated. So now I've read your blog, uh -huh. and it, which is it's a good blog for Thanks. sure, um, and I recently had written about uh, Trying to clear the confusion between security boundaries uh, and gatekeeper technologies like UAC, mm -hmm. which basically just throws up UI and says, "Hey, you know, some boundaries trying to cross into trying to do something that requires elevated privileges. Do you want to let it do it?" It's more complicated than that, but UAC really isn't super complex, as we illustrated in the video that we released recently mm -hmm. with John Schwartz. I mean, right. they didn't write a ton of code. Um, so what I wanted to ask was, I guess I was going somewhere with that. Yes, uh, you had written this article talking about the differences. I mean, someone had, I can't remember the name, a hacker or, not a hacker, but a security researcher from uh, Eastern Europe has uh -huh. stated that there's a glaring, terrible security vulnerability in the whole UAC model. You know, it, in, installers can run as admin, right? So. You didn't write a post necessarily to confront that. You just happened to post something out yeah. at a similar time. But let's talk about, like, just let's clear up what she said and what you're talking about and try to develop some sort of understanding here. Okay. Okay. Sure. Uh, basically, what she said, like you pointed out, was mm -hmm. there's a, a security vulnerability because sys installer, there's installer detection built into Windows Vista. Okay. Where I don't know if you, I didn't, I haven't seen the John. Uh, Schwartz interview, so I don't know how deeply he got into these kinds of things, but yeah. the installer detection functionality basically looks at the file name and uses some heuristics like does it have setup, install, or update in the name, and <laughs> if so, I'm gonna, and it doesn't have a, a manifest, a marker that mm -hmm. indicates that the developer wrote this for Windows Vista or wrote it for per user install, mm -hmm. I'm going to assume that this thing needs to access system or admin rights mm -hmm. to be able to create a directory under program files, for example, which you can't do as a standard user. Okay. And she viewed this as a, 
the installer detection as a security problem? Why does it automatically assume that all of these things are require admin rights? And if you talk to John and the team that put in this, the, these heuristics, mm -hmm. the fact is that almost everything that everything that they've come across that has install setup or update in the name, and there's some deeper heuristics that actually look inside the image, that all of those are indeed system-wide installation packages that do need admin rights. And so it gets it right probably, you know, I'll just be safe and say 99.9% .9 of the time. Cool. The heuristic is correct. Now, um, there's other security researchers like uh, that have pointed out that you that the shield uh, or the UI dialog that you get when you try to elevate something, when, when mm -hmm. something wants admin rights and you get this user account control pop-up dialog box that says application XYZ wants admin rights and it, if it's a Windows component it gets a blue stripe across the dialog box kind of as a hey this is, let me give you an idea the blue means that it's a Windows thing okay. that you're giving admin rights to and they pointed out with a certain Windows component that you could pass in a command line that would cause it to load some other code and, then, hmm. and he, the argument was that the blue doesn't really mean Windows anymore it means because you're actually starting other code too and my blog post kind of addresses that in with the general sure. uh, message that that when you elevate something when you're running in a standard user account which can either be true standard user or in a mode called admin approval mode mm -hmm. where you get the yes no on the elevation dialog instead of the give me admin credentials Good which point. you get from standard user yep. that uh, the elevation is not a security boundary it's a convenience and it's a convenience that was put into the system because we want to get people to run a standard user because it's okay. kind of a feedback loop. If you uh, don't have people running a standard user, then ISVs aren't going to write programs for people to run a standard user and users aren't going to run, run a standard user. Sure. We want to have people running a standard user because they, uh, that has lots of goodness. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, they can't you can't accidentally go and mess with system configuration. With user account control, even if you're an admin, you get told, hey, mm -hmm. the thing you're about to do through that elevation dialog is going to potentially, it's going to change system configuration or yeah. modify it. So, you know, that's uh, kind of a mess warning to you or heads up to you that you're going to do something that could potentially t impact the stability of the whole machine. Or, Absolutely. Uh, then malware can't mess with the system state without it getting elevated like that. Mm -hmm. um, and it opens the door with the Vista user account control technologies like virtualization that John probably talked about. Absolutely. To getting legacy applications to run a standard user that weren't written for standard user environments and mm -hmm. getting people into being able to run a standard user as, as much as possible. Mm -hmm. In the home environment, There's you get children, for example, on shared PCs that you can have running a standard user all the time. Yep. In corporate environments with, that are in managed where their software is being deployed to them, you can have now corporate users that are running a standard user all the time, mm -hmm. and that's going to minimize help desk calls. And absolutely. So I sound like a marketing message at this point. But no, but it's true. It, yeah, it's absolutely true. And the, the elevations were put in the system because without them, mm -hmm. you're going to have users that are going to want to do admin things, like install software, or open port on the firewall. and if you had them switch to an admin account, if you said, oh, I'm going to put you in a standard user account. Mm -hmm. Oh, but if you want to do one of those admin type things, you're going to need to switch out, switch back into the admin account to do it. Mm -hmm. A lot of people would say, well, that's kind of onerous. I don't yeah. want to do that. Totally. So I'm just going to run in the admin account all the time, and there's no progress then. Yeah. That ISVs look at the situation, they're running as admins all the time, mm -hmm. users are running as admin, and you know, so. Yeah. The elevations are a convenience, which gets people to run a standard user. Even if you're an admin, you're really all your stuff's running a standard user unless you agree to one of those elevations. Absolutely, and, and that's really critically important to is. stress. That, I mean, even if you are like you're saying, if you're running in what is it called? Admin Elevate, approval mode. Admin approval mode. You're still running a standard user yeah. for your process context. Yeah. Nothing's going to be able. To, you're you're still a standard user. You're still a standard user. If you never elevate, you're running. You're equivalent to standard user. Excellent. Now, if you elevate, you're basically saying the convenience of me elevating outweighs mm -hmm. me switching to a different account and doing the admin operation. Yes. 
or where the inconvenience will be set. Sure, and you know, at home, hopefully your kids don't know the administrator password for right. the machine. Right, right. They shouldn't, and the parent yeah. comes over and can type in the admin password. The for smart those. ones will, yeah. because they'll know that they can override parental controls and various other things. Um, Maybe. Ac well, no, actually, they, <laughs> well, the elevation is, like I said, is not a security boundary, so they could. Good point. They could figure it out, right? If the parent comes over and does one of these over-the-shoulder elevations. The child's like super uber hacker, or uh -huh. they could figure out how to steal the admin parent's credentials uh, through a fake over the shoulder dialog box, or malware could do it. Sure. Uh, and again, it's a, one of these trade offs of security versus convenience. And yes. built into the system, there's a switch you can flip that says uh, to, for the parent to even get to that admin approval, that over the shoulder dialog box, mm -hmm. they've got to hit control and delete. Excellent. And when they do that, Malware can't then spoof the, that keyboard sequence or intercept it, and so that gives the parent an assurance that malware is not intercepting their credentials. Mm -hmm. So that's one level of of they want to be more secure, trade off a little convenience. They can go configure that. So let me just interject because this this is confusing in the sense that one of the reasons that that the shell team created uh, the dead desktop, if you will, yeah. which is what happens when you get a prompt. It's just a snapshot of the desktop plus some UI that you can interact with on another desktop, uh -huh. right? Yep. That, I thought the idea behind that was there's no way to spoof that. There's, well, there's no, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> they, well, uh, let me clarify. Sure, that's right. Uh, because spoof, uh, the, the reason that it goes to a separate desktop and the definition of spoof in the context that you're using it yeah. for why the rationale for why switch it to diff different desktop is that malware, if it happens to be on the machine, can't overlay the dialog box and make it look different. Like okay. it can't put a window on top of that blue bar and make it, or an orange bar, that, which is what you get when you run something that's not signed by somebody you trust or mm -hmm. not digitally signed. Okay. They can't put a blue bar on top of it and make it look like it's Micro, you know, Windows component, or, and change the put a, something over the description that makes it look like it's a Windows component, and change the cursor so that when you're moving the cursor out and you're pressing the, you think you're pressing the cancel, it's really pressing the uh, continue okay. button, right? <laughs> so they can't do those things. Understood. When because that desktop, separate desktop, is inaccessible to the malware. So that's the kind of spoofing that that they're talking about when yeah, okay. the separate desktop is preventing. Now for over the shoulder. Elevations. That's well, the kind. What is an over-the-shoulder? Yeah, an over-the-shoulder. The, so there's, if you're really running a standard user with mm -hmm. user account control turned on, and you run something that requests admin rights, then you switch to that separate desktop with the faded background. The dialog box has the coloration and the description of what asking for the elevation. The fact that it's over the shoulder means you're being uh, to grant the elevation. You need to provide admin credentials. Okay. So the username and password for an admin account. Got it. And the scenario where people are running a standard user and they're going to want to elevate and have somebody come and give admin credentials is the most common scenario we'll see that in Vista is in the home mm -hmm. on a shared PC or PC that's the child's PC mm -hmm. which is the parent wants to make sure stays clean from an admin point of view the child is running as a standard user now they go and want to install a game and the game requires elevation they're going to get the elevation dialog box the parent then has two options. They can log into an admin account and install the game from there, mm -hmm. or if they want it, which is more secure, mm -hmm. potentially, uh, or they can grant their admin rights to the game installer right there. The child gets the over-the-shoulder elevation dialog box, calls the parent to, over and says, I want to install this game, mm -hmm. and the parent types in their credentials over the child's shoulder. So Got that's over-the-shoulder. Excellent. So. What the, the note to parents out there is uh, have the child go get some Kool-Aid or leave yeah. the room. Yeah, so and they then, don't watch Especially the if, you're caught, if, you, if you think you have a hacker for a child. Yeah. Okay. Now, and then there's Good, Better, Best, which <laughs> if you go read Jim's blog, he talked about this. His, one of Jim Walton's last blog posts was about security versus convenience. Mm -hmm. And to if you really don't trust the child or trust that they've run that the stuff that they've run that they might be infected with malware that's aware, Vista, you know, aware, mm -hmm. then you're going to want to go turn on that control alt delete option too, because that's the kind of spoof. The kind of spoof that that prevents is malware if it's on the machine waiting for the child to run something that's going to request admin rights like the game installer, mm -hmm. intercept that, 
which it can do because it's running in the child's account, and then throw up a, dialog, a screen that looks like the secure desktop that has the faded background and a dialog box that looks like the UAC dialog box. Hmm. Because then the parent comes over, types in their credentials, and now the malware has the admin's, the parent's credentials, and can infect the parent's account. Now, but, but you, you said something, I mean, you kind of drifted by it quickly. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by, because uh, malware can intercept uh, process elevation requests? Yeah, so. Why? Well, it, well, if we're making the assumption that their child's account is infected, and I'll okay. come back to that in okay. a minute. So let's just say the child has malware running in the account. Now the malware running in that child's account can see everything the child does. It can see their keystrokes. It can watch what programs they launch. Got it. And so when they go launch this game, it can look at the game and go, oh, this looks like an installer. I know there's going to be a UAC pop, uh, prompt here. Mm -hmm. I know the child's going to expect to see one, and the parent's going to expect to see one too. So what I'm going to do is put up a fake one. Okay and capture the parent's credentials. And now with the parent's credentials, I gain access to the admin account. But now the thing that I'm confused with is that if the malware is running, because let's be honest, if, if the child puts 64 is a very, I mean, that's the future. 32-bit yep. is great, it's still around for compatibility reasons. 64-bit yep. is the future, then we moved to 128-bit. And we chose an X64 for Vista to be very strict. Everything has to be signed on the machine. Yeah. You can't have a driver on there that's not signed. All executables need to be signed that ship in the box. Yeah. And that would hurt 32-bit compatibility world. So let's talk about how does one go about preventing a rootkit? How does one go about preventing a rootkit? Don't run Automatic anything. <laughs> <laughs> Disconnect from the network and don't run anything. Okay. So let's talk about patch guard then, yeah. briefly. I mean. So uh, patch guard is not so much a rootkit detection mechanism. It's a best practices in kernel mode okay. enforcement mechanism. Sure. So uh, it basically sits in the background and looks at kernel data structures and code, mm -hmm. just a small set of what's in the kernel, mm -hmm. the very core. And if it detects that somebody's messing with that stuff, we'll crash the machine. Mm -hmm. Now, it's considered a rootkit detection mechanism because rootkits commonly go and on 32-bit systems go mess with those core data structures in order to hook into the system at a deep level and mm -hmm. manipulate what the systems what other stuff sees about what's going on sure but when I say best practices uh, there's lots of software out there that's legitimate software that does these things on 32-bit windows mm -hmm. that are not rootkits I mentioned red uh, did I mention Regmon earlier I no, talked about FileMon. Yeah, but Regmon. Yeah, Regmon cool. came out. That was the third tool that we wrote for Windows XP. Regmon to monitor registry activity. And the, when I looked at at registry, I, I realized that file system was really important to the operation of Windows. And then I immediately realized the registry is also really important. Mm -hmm. And how can I see what's going on in the registry? There's no filtering model like there is for file system filters, like mm -hmm. FileMon could take advantage of for the registry on Windows NT, those earlier versions. So. I went back to the way that I'd done things on Unix, which is by hooking the system call table, uh, the way that I'd done it with Unix source code when I was working on my PhD. But now I was doing it from outside without, without the source, but I was just patching that data structure directly. So that when somebody calls a system call, that goes through a table, an index table. So mm -hmm. you call a system call and it's identified to you as a name, but internally it's a number. Mm -hmm. And the number is just an index into this table and the kernel calls the function that's at that index in the table. Mm. If I replace the function in that index then to, with a pointer to my own code, then the kernel, when it call, somebody calls that system call, actually calls me, not the kernel's function. Mm. And so now I get invoked, I can look at the parameters going in, then I call the original function, the kernel's original function, and I get control back after it's finished, I look at the results, and then I can return back to the caller. And Regmon did that to watch stuff going into the registry APIs and coming back, and the statuses coming back out, and data coming back out. Okay. That patching of the system call table is not supported, and there's race conditions that are associated with it, and so it's it's not a best practice from kernel mode programming point of view. And sure, uh, with Windows Server 2003, actually the the work started in XP, but really was kind of fleshed out in Server 2003. 
there's a filtering model that was developed for the registry, so you don't have to hook anymore. You can just call the registry and say, I'd like to see registry calls, and then you get called in a, in a supported way by the OS, and it makes sure that you're called in line safely with other th guys that want to see what's going on with the registry. Excellent. So that's the best practice there, not hooking the, the system call table. Sure. So Pat one of patch guard. So there's legitimate. Regmon was legitimate software. It wasn't Absolutely. written, but it was doing something that wasn't best practice because I was basically forced to. True. At the time, but understood. I mean, that's that's a good point. I mean, there's other companies that have written rootkits. Uh, yeah. The, you know, for but they weren't really trying. <laughs> yeah. But boy, they got hammered. Yeah. Uh, and deser deservedly so, in my opinion. But let me ask you this. I mean, FileMon certainly. You know, Regmon certainly not in that. That's a, that's a tool for. Persistent mins and developers to use to help them do their job on mm -hmm. this. Um, so, the core problem here, of course, is allowing people to run random code in the kernel, which unfortunately you need to do if you want to have things like drivers yeah. that, that you know, give you your screen and whatever else. But in Vista, we've done a great job of moving some of that stuff up into user mode. Mm -hmm. uh, Actually, that stuff that supports an XP too. Does it? Yeah. So back backwards? Yep. Like how's that? So Explain. there's well there's a something called the user mode driver framework. Absolutely. Which yeah, you've probably done it. I We've think you've done, done it channel nine. Yeah, we had yeah, Dorn Hall on yeah, Dorn. Yeah. Was, was he kernel mode? One yeah, of them. He did user mode too. Okay, cool. Yeah. So user mode driver framework is basically support in the OS through a service, the user mode driver framework service that hosts uh, so people program to this new model. Mm -hmm. They want their driver to run in user mode. And this is a model that people that write drivers for a, a whole bunch of classes of devices, like USB devices, the big one. Yeah. So if you got something that talks to USB, you can write it as a user mode driver, and then it runs inside of a host process up in user mode, Good. and it talks to the device through it proxy calls into the user mode driver framework, which consists of user mode code and a kernel mode driver. Cool. Yeah. So the benefit you get out of that is not security so much, but reliability, because yeah. now your driver crashes. The user mode driver framework starts it up again, mm -hmm. and from the user's point of view, nothing happened. They might get a balloon that says, "You know, this the device experienced a problem, but it's recovered or whatever." Yeah, but, totally. But we they don't get a blue started. screen. You got it. Yeah. So, uh, so that's the big benefit of user mode drivers. Mm -hmm. And I forgot where where. Well, where I was going was, I mean, uh, and that's typically in my yeah. interviews because I mean, we take them all over the place. But I mean, where I was going with that is is the real problem, the root of the rootkit problem. And it's not like it's a vast, terrible problem. I mean, I'm yeah. not trying to paint that picture. Is the fact that we allow people to write code in the kernel, and we have for a very, very long time. Um, and we can't talk about the future of Windows, but we can talk about like X64. Yeah. Where, if you're going to write code in the kernel, it has to be signed. Yep. Okay. Right? Well, let me talk about that sure, for a second. Sure. Please. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned driver signing on 64-bit, uh, which is the new policy in Windows Vista. Uh -huh. On 32-bit Vista, by the way, you can flip a switch and say that that's the policy for 32-bit as well, but by, off by default because of all the legacy stuff out there that's not signed. Sure. Is that a security boundary? We talk, You talked yeah, about that? security boundaries. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> so so right. that is, um, that is uh, uh, kind of a better world where the, that's the policy uh, that the system will enforce by default. If you get arbitrary code running on this machine, it can mess with that policy. Okay. And without, if it gets admin rights on the machine, it can mess with that policy. So, is it a security boundary from the point of, from uh, perspective of a standard user? Yeah, standard user, but standard user can't install drivers anyway. But is it a security boundary from the point of view of an admin user? No. There's if you're an admin on the box today, you've got your you own the box. Mm -hmm. uh, even patch patch guard is not a security boundary either. It's because somebody could figure out a way to hey patch guard's looking here or patch guard's doing this kind of detection and I can sure. foil it this particular way. Now let me ask you this question real quickly because you come from the Unix background. Yeah. Let's make no mistake. That's a that's a Unix legacy of having user of having uh, various modes of security context, if you will, root and whatever, user. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I guess one, you know, kind of begs the question, how long do we keep, have to keep having this 20, 20 year model, right? I mean, maybe it wasn't the case in Windows 95 where you just, God knows what you ran as, I don't even remember. Yeah. Um, but is it, wouldn't that make sense to have, like, where you, you don't have to think about, that's an administrative task, that's a, 
I'm a user, right? Yeah. I'm sitting at home. Like, like my dad, I don't want my dad thinking about security boundaries. Yeah. I want him to check his email. I want him to, to play his games, do what he does on his computer, right? Yep. That's the goal for the consumer. So it just seems to me like it's a really hard problem that you guys are working on. And yeah, like, it, and maybe you can help educate me a little more and everybody watching. Let's let's clearly define security boundaries. Okay. Because clearly I don't, yeah. I'm not understanding. Security boundaries, so you've got uh, something over here and something over there. And <laughs> this guy wants to mess with this guy. Okay. Security boundary. If you put a security boundary in the middle, yeah. you can't do it without some security policy dictating what this guy can do to this guy. Oh, okay. If if uh, you can't put a policy in place that stops A from affecting B in a certain way, mm -hmm. then that's not a security boundary. So if there's a way through that from A to B okay. with, that doesn't stop it, hey, is that allowed or not? Okay. Then it's not a security boundary. So then theoretically, then based on that definition, running as administrator automatically does away with any notion of security boundary whatsoever. And Windows today, yeah. Yeah. You, because as admin, you have all the privileges of, mm -hmm. that are the most powerful privileges. You can load a driver. And the, even admin approval mode. So just to clarify that, mm -hmm. when we talked about admin approval mode where you're basically running as a standard user. Mm -hmm. But you are an admin. If you, you can choose to elevate at any point in time just by pressing the continue button. Yes, so, correct. So you are an admin. And you basically are defining the policy interactively at that point. Mm -hmm. When you say continue, you're saying my policy as admin is to let this happen. You got well, it. Or to open the, uh, to let whatever is happening and now happen. And you don't really know what's going to happen when you press that continue button. Like I said, it's there's no security boundary when you press that continue button. So there's a security boundary up until that point. Yeah. You press the continue and the boundary's just dropped. And now mm. Now you've just let something run with admin rights, but you can't really say what's run with admin rights. You know that the executable, you know which executable ran, mm -hmm. but you don't know what that executable is, what DLLs it's going to pull into itself, and what code it's going to pull into itself, and what other processes it's going to talk to as admin that might influence its behavior. So, Interesting. So well, that's where, that's where um, the dialog box identifies the exe, but not anything else at this point. True. At this point, so there's no security boundary there. That's interesting. And that, once you elevate, that is your full admin context with all your privileges, all your accesses. Mm. So you know, just take for example a command prompt. You elevate a command prompt. Yeah. Now you can do any. You can delete basically any file. You can run any program. You can load drivers from there mm -hmm. because that command prompt has full admin control. So I mean, I guess. It kind of begs the question. I mean, I don't get a lot of prompts on my day to day. Yeah, and I, you should. I'm not doing a lot of administrative tasks. Yeah, right. I'm not which is, which are going to be rare. Typically. Yeah, you got it. Yeah. So the average user, if they're at home and they're experiencing, there's a lot of UAC is taking a beating. Yeah. I mean, it's an aggressive, in-your-face sort of, you know, do you sure you want to do that? And of course, people are make Apple makes fun of us, but you know, let's talk about uh, the trade-offs that you have to make, right? At least you're giving a standard user running in admin approval mode the ability to say no. And I've said no before, mm -hmm. just because I actually I don't really, I'm not exactly sure what that service is doing. Yep. And so no, don't yeah, there's, there's two things that you get with that. Is one is the ability to say no if something pops up, pops up suspiciously. Mm -hmm. The second is if malware does want to take get admin rights. But, you know, it's already, if, if you've got arbitrary code running in your mm -hmm. account, I don't know about you, but that would pretty much really ruin my day. Yeah. Because the malware running in my account has access to all my data. Sure. Can watch everything I do. Can watch me log into my bank. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, so that's that's not good for me. But mm -hmm. if uh, so, malware can do a lot as you now. Yeah. But malware, if you're running a standard user or if you're not elevating it, can't mess with the machine. It can't turn off the antivirus, which if you look at Windows XP, where you're running as admin, the yeah. second a malware touches your box, mm -hmm. uh, your anti-malware can be disabled like that, right? And, <laughs> and the thing can install itself as a kernel rootkit and bury itself so deeply that it'll, you can never get it off without reformatting the machine. Mm -hmm. If it infects your account as a standard user, 
but doesn't disable security software. That gives the security software always a chance to clean the thing off. You know, one, if Microsoft's Windows Defender team, this is a, a virus or a piece of malware that they get signatures for. They, mm -hmm. they figure out, hey, we've got to clean this thing off customer machines or even Microsoft software malicious removal tool that comes out down with Windows Update and runs. Mm -hmm. Now that thing can be cleaned because it's not embedded deeply and it's only in your account. So yeah. we can clean it. And, uh, but the second you elevate, the thing can take over the machine too, potentially. Okay. So um, I forgot where we're going with that too. That's but, fine. That doesn't matter. But, we're just yeah, having a conversation. But, but the elevation, the, the bottom line is, and I wrote, I've actually written a, a monster article I, I, uh, on user account control internals. The way that all the different mechanisms work and then talks about security boundaries and not security boundaries for TechNet Magazine. Again, Excellent. I didn't have... If you, it's kind of interesting because if you look at the first three, this, that three-part series mm -hmm. on Vista kernel changes, where I don't talk about UAC at all, or the virtualization or the integrity level mechanisms mm -hmm. or the elevation process, mm -hmm. that three-part series is like 12,000 words, and UAC article alone is 6,000. Wow. So it's, it's you know, it's, to get it covered right is, yeah. a, is a huge thing. And so that's going to be in the June issue of the magazine. Fantastic. Point, and I talk about all these things. Cool. And we, in, in the one on Channel 9, John drew out the diagram, but it certainly wasn't a 6,000 word uh, deep discussion. And that's just being terse, too. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. So um, let's jump back to you now. I mean, we've covered this. I and mean, it's very interesting that you're working at Microsoft. I mean, it makes sense. You've been working on system internals for so long. Mm -hmm. uh, and you really care about and are interested in how, you know, making Windows better and how it works. And, learning more and more about it. And working with some of the smartest people in the industry, obviously, probably is fun. Yeah. Um, what got you in, the, I mean, what got you excited about computer science and computers in general? I mean, why did you get into this racket? How's that for a question? All right. Well, we've got to reach pretty far back for that one. Well, um, all right. So, uh, it, so when I, when I was, was growing up, when I was young, uh, uh -huh. I thought, always thought I wanted to be an aeronautical engineer. That's what really excited me, planes, designing planes, okay. and in uh, ninth grade, uh, my friend's father worked for University of Alabama in Birmingham and got an Apple II for his home. It was one of the first ones, and okay. I went over and I spent the night there, and it's like, oh, look what my dad got, this computer. Oh. So we started playing on the Apple II, and that's when I was, it's like literally, Bang. probably within hours of yeah. starting to work on that, I said, this is what I'm going to do. Wow. So that so I became an Apple II internals expert, actually, <laughs> before I became anything else. And uh, I knew Apple, the Apple ROM. I had the Apple ROM source code listing. I learned machine language for the Apple. I wrote in it a, a, wow. a disassembler assembler for it. And I wrote some extensions to Apple Soft. And mm -hmm. I wrote some tools for it. And actually, that's how I got into writing, too, for about computers. My first magazine article was called Apple, high -res, Apple II High-Risk Screen Dump. Nice. And it was published in... Uh, like December '86 issue of Compute Magazine, <laughs> so that was that started cool. off the road. and then I just was like, okay, off to the let races. Me, let me ride this. That's cool. And then you just went and got yeah. your PhD. Yeah, amazing. And now you're at Microsoft. And now I'm at Microsoft. And what do you do? I mean, you're you're on the Windows core team. Yeah. But you know, you're working on uh, so, this stuff. Yeah. There's uh, so being on the Windows core team, I'm on this. Uh, board called Core Arch, which you've done a channel nine yeah, before so too. I, right? man. So I'm on Core Arch, and being on Core Arch means that you're doing a lot of different things that are kind of over. Or it's kind of architectural guidance mm -hmm. and oversight uh, across Windows. So, which has you interact with a whole bunch of different groups and talk about into problems and how do we architect? How do what are best practices? Design paradigms for new APIs and yeah. new architectures. Uh, that would be developed on top of Windows. So that takes me all over the place. And then I'm doing uh, kind of the core Windows uh, ownership of, or leadership, or yeah. I don't know, kind of the focal point for bringing together different people's input and putting it all down and kind of digesting it and saying, here's what's good, here's what's bad, here's where I think we should go with this. Uh, the team was formed for Vista, mm -hmm. right? And they actually accomplished some great things, in my opinion, uh, particularly around understanding the dependencies in our operating system. They're yep. understood now, yep. and that's a great thing. 
So, I mean, it's not something that you market, right? It's yeah. like Windows marketing. Like, Clear, connected, confident, and we understand all <laughs> yeah. the dependencies. Yeah, and we've got a layered system now. By the yeah. way, <laughs> that's fantastic. Well, let's talk a little bit about layered system. I mean, uh -huh. you know, in what sense? Like, it, well, uh, it, you talk to Rich Nevs and Rich Pletcher. I yeah, think, um, Rich Nevs was in that Channel Nine interview. Absolutely, he was. And he talked about MinWin project that mm -hmm. he's working on, which so it's analyzing the dependencies between different components and being, and then saying, okay, looking at these dependencies. It looks like the system, because nobody really started, you know, the system's kind of evolved sure. organically over time, but if we look at the dependencies, it looks like there's a layer of stuff here, and, and it talk, sits on top of this layer of stuff, mm -hmm. so where can we draw these layers and cut the lines appropriately, and then how can we make a kind of core version of Windows that is really, let's define what the core of Windows is, that all the other stuff is built on top of, let's take a, a line and draw it and cut everything you know, all those dependencies that that um, make them explicitly cross this line mm -hmm. and not have any cyclic dependencies, Rich talks about, Absolutely. that go from low to high and then come back down. If we can have one-way dependencies at, across this line, then we've got a core version of Windows. Excellent. And that has a engineering benefits to it. It's not something that you put in the box, right? But Sure, but it has engineering. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So if I own a component, right, my team yep. owns a component in Windows, I am able to express myself in such a way that these are my dependencies and therefore other systems, other components will go, ah, this guy depends on these things. Therefore, if we do these operations, we have to be careful. We can't like remove this, the DLL it's dependent on, we can't change versioning, whatever. Yep. Whatever the complex Insane, insane engineering that's going on, but my point is all components in Vista are able to express their dependencies. Their dependencies right. and that, well, that, because that's huge. That componentization, that dependency stuff is slightly different than what Rich is doing. Okay. Uh, so the Rich, Min, and Rich Pletcher and Rich Navs, this uh -huh. Min, Win thing <laughs> is different than the component model that you're talking about for component-based servicing, which is exactly. Vista, which also does the dependency thing. Mm -hmm. Now he's looking at um, kind of engineering dependencies and trying to cut the line, make a core version of Windows that can evolve or stay stable. Stuff can evolve on top of it, mm -hmm. independently of the core. And so that... That's an incredible yeah, project. That's a, and, and then the, the whole dependency thing, if you talk about the components mm -hmm. and the, the pieces like DL, what things DLLs depend on, mm -hmm. down to that finer grain level, mm -hmm. understanding the dependencies means we can recognize when a cycle is about to take place. And cycles are really bad mm. because for a number of reasons. For for servicing, it means, like, I want to service this thing, but it has dependency on it, which has dependency on that, which has a dependency back on me. Then it's like, all right, we've got to service all these guys to service this. Um, Good point. And, and now we can't ship this thing by itself. I mean, it's just, the, the cycles are bad, as rich, the riches will tell you. Absolutely, the riches. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Well, we want, I want to get all you guys back on uh, like a core arc update because you know, yeah. I think it's important. One of the things that we that, that Channel Nine is is a is a uh, it's a front row seat right in the cockpit. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, we're not going to be so far out that we can't talk about things, but it would be nice to know like okay, what are the architects thinking like it, you know a year from now? Like what you know when we have something we can talk about publicly. I'd love to be able to meet with you guys again and like yeah. just have that conversation again. I'm sure we'd be we'd love to do it. Cool. Uh, so, you know, I've taken up a, a lot of your time. I know you're a busy guy. Um, thank you. I think sure. we at least if nothing else, you know, we've had a nice conversation. We understand security boundaries. We understand that UAC isn't a security boundary. It's more of a gatekeeper. Yep. Right. That will it's, remove well, it's, the boundary. It, it gets us into standard user world. That's Got the, it. The, the goal there. And Vista is is our most secure operating system today. Yep. And I didn't and I didn't mention all the other things that go into that. Why is it the most secure? We we, we hit did on some of them, but we hit on some. There's other things like BitLocker and Windows Defender being in the system. And sure. Some other things that. Absolutely, but I, I'm looking forward to a day when the notion of admin and standard user